it's really good to be here with all of you this morning. Uh, if you hadn't got a chance, and there were some people that I met this morning that were like, yeah, I haven't been here for the past couple weeks. So uh, I am Josh. I am a church planner in Appleton, Wisconsin, planting Exodus Church. Uh, this is my final week here with you guys before you start a new interim pastor, uh, who is a great guy. So and there, he's going to be introduced a little bit later, probably after after I talk. So <clears throat> so this morning, uh, I'm going to be continuing finishing up our my kind of mini-series called Real Jesus, Real Life in the Gospel of John. So uh, there are a couple different ways that you can follow along with this passage. Uh, you can look in the back of your bulletin. The passage is there. It's John 15, 9 through 17. You can open your Bible, you can open your Bible app, or you can follow along right here. So there's a couple different ways I'm going to read the passage, pray for us, and then I'm going to get started. This week we're going to be talking about real friendship, so get ready. This is going to be good. So uh, will you listen, and then I'm going to pray, and then we'll get started. So this is John 15, verses 9 through 17. So this is Jesus speaking. In verse 9, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the father will give you. This is my command, love each other. That's John 15, 9 through 17. Please pray with me. Father, we are thankful for this morning. We are thankful for your presence here and your presence in our lives and thankful that we can gather here this morning to worship you and to give you glory through singing and through hearing the word preached, through praying together and through being here in fellowship with one another. Spirit, I pray today that you would help me to exalt the name of Jesus highly as I preach that you would speak through me, that the words that I speak would not be mine, but would be yours. And if anything, that I would get out of the way so that you can speak here this morning. And I'm thankful to have this opportunity to do that. And we pray this in Jesus' good, wonderful, and perfect name. Amen. Okay, so as I said, I'm going to be talking about friendship this morning. Um, and you know, friendships are an extremely significant thing. Like I talk a lot about like how the, the, the family of God is, you know, we're a family together, right? Like the church is a family, but we also can't forget, you know, I've been watching the Godfather a lot recently. Uh, it just came on Netflix. So like when I think of family, I think of like, you know, the family, like we're all together and like we do things for family, but it's important that Jesus talks a lot about friendship and friendship with God, right? Because it goes beyond just loyalty. It goes to more of like an intimate relationship and friends are extremely important. My kids are getting to about the point in your lives, and I'm sure most of you have reached that, reached a point in your life where friends started to take on a more significant role than family did at some point. You know, like I said, my kids are about to reach that age now where like, you know, parents are not cool at all anymore, and friends are like the only thing that really matters. You know, that, I mean, that already happens a lot. You know, they, they want to spend time with friends, and, and you know, I had that happen too. I had a really big group of high school friends that were really important to me, and they are significant relationships, and I had that in college as well. And those college relationships, most of those guys stood up in my wedding. I also got married in college, so that helped too. They all just stood up because I got married so early. Um, but, you know, also we need to recognize that those can be some of the most significant relationships that we have in our entire life, but they can also be some of the most hurtful and the most painful relationships that we can have in our life. And going back to my high school friends, when I went to college, I became a Christian when I was 19 at the University of Wisconsin-Stevens Point. Uh, That's where I met my wife, Tina. And, uh, you know, it's it's basically flipped the story of my life around when I went to college and and Jesus, you know, I met Jesus there. And my high school friends, they didn't really understand that. Like, I was really close to them. I still drove back when I was 18 and 19 all the way from Stevens Point to Brookfield where I grew up. And we'd still get together. And, like, they hated it that I went and worked at camp that summer uh, when I was 18. But, like, when I had turned 19, I went and worked at a summer camp, and they hated that. Like, 
they, uh, my friend Sean sent me this really hilarious, like, uh, you know, back in the day you could burn CDs. He burnt songs that he wrote himself talking about how lame it was that I was at camp and wasn't home to, like, hang out with them all summer. So, you know, the, our relationships meant a lot, and it meant a lot to me, too. But when I became a Christian, I don't think my friends really understood what that meant for me. None of my friends were Christians growing up. We were a bunch of hoodlums. So uh, when, <laughs> when I became a Christian, they didn't really understand all of that. And so I think that what started to happen with my friends is they saw my life changing. They saw when I would come back and hang out with them, I would talk about Jesus a lot, and I would talk about, you know, what I was doing with a church and things like that, and they didn't understand that. And their response to that understanding was not to try to listen to me, but it was to hurt me. And so I lost those friendships because over the years, they made fun of me. They, you know, they belittled me. They belittled my faith and everything like that, and we eventually drifted apart. And I mean, honestly, I can stand here and talk about it with a smile on my face now, but at the time, and it still does a little bit, it still really hurts because I miss those friendships a lot. And by the grace of God, I've been able to repair some of those relationships. You know, when I went to a wedding, I was basically, it would be like, hey, listen, look, Christians can be real normal people. Trust me. So, and I I gained back a little bit of that from them, but that really hurt my friendship. And I'm sure that you have gone through those same things as well, whether you're 12 years old or whether you're 60 years old. You've gone through friendships and you've gone through things that have been extremely painful They've been some of the most significant relationships of your entire life. Some of you, the closest people you might have in your life is a good friend. But you also may have had people that were close but aren't close anymore, and it hurts now. And that's really what we want to talk about here this morning. And Jesus, what he's going to do here is talking about friendships and how Jesus offers us a better way to be a friend of God and that our friendship is really complete in Christ, that our relationships, we can have friendships but they're really not complete unless they're in Christ. And so Jesus is going to explain this here in this passage in John 15 to the disciples of what it looks like for us to call God our friend. And we start by doing that by looking at Jesus' relationship with the Father and looking at our relationship with Jesus. And so in this passage, there's really four things that we can glean from this passage. And yes, because I'm a pastor, they all start with the same letter. And we, li- we look at Jesus because he loved the Father, he listened to the Father, he lived for the Father, and he lasted for the Father. And so if we look at verse 9 here, we're going to start by talking about how Jesus showed and talked to the disciples about how he loved the Father. He says in verse 9, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. And Jesus is talking here about his relationship with God. There is nobody in the entire world, in the history of all things, throughout all of eternity, who has been closer to God the Father than Christ the Son. And so he's talking about, as I have loved the Father, so have I loved you. Jesus was in perfect community. When we talk about the Trinity, this idea that will be considered extra-biblical because it's, we use it to explain something within the Bible— uh, it is very biblical, but it is not, the word Trinity is not found in the Bible, but it's all there, you know. Um, he was in perfect communion with both the Father and with the Holy Spirit. They were three in one, in perfect community together, perfect love amongst one another. And that's why Jesus says in a different place in the Gospel of John, I and the Father are one. We are together as one. And so how did he stay connected? I mean, Jesus doesn't really explain like how he loves, but we've kind of talked a little bit about how God, how Jesus and God have a loving relationship. Jesus did this through worship and prayer throughout the entire gospel and really Jesus' entire life. This isn't just the gospel of John, but he worshiped God through adoration, through thankfulness. He was constantly thanking God for what he'd done. Like before he did miracles, a lot of times he's saying, God, I thank you for this. I think about when he raised Lazarus from the dead, when we talked about that in John 11, you know, before he says, he basically said, thanks God and then raises Lazarus from the dead through his words. He's worshiping the Father. But then also he's intimately connected because what does Jesus do constantly throughout his, enti- throughout his entire ministry? He's praying to God, right? He finds time alone. A lot of times, like when he walked on the water, right? He had gone off by himself to pray by himself and sent the disciples on ahead because he was intimately connected with the Father. There was no one more in communion with God than Jesus Christ, because he was one with the Father. That's how he says, as the Father has loved me, because they're an intimate relationship with one another. And that's why, like, when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, why we call this communion, because it's really us being able to commune with 
God, to have a little bit of that relationship that they have with one another when we partake in the Lord's Supper and remember Jesus' death on the cross. And so we're not members of the Trinity, right? If you think that, then you need to um, be corrected. We're not members of the Trinity, but no one thinks that. That was a terrible joke. Um, Okay, but we are still called to commune with Jesus, right? And we do it through the same way that Jesus taught us. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. And now he wants us to remain in his love, to be connected to him. And we do that through the same way, through worshiping him together and praying. That's two of the most important things that we do here every Sunday morning when we get together, is that we worship together and we pray together. Really, this whole thing is about worship, right? And prayer and singing here, like singing songs, is really just musical prayer to God. That's really all it is, right? I mean, we're singing to God and praying to him and giving him thanks and adoration and confession and, you know, supplication, praying for other people, all these things that are a part of what prayer is. All of this is all connected, and we're called to do the same thing, to be in communion with God. That's how we love Jesus is through that communion connection, that worship, and that prayer. And we don't just do it on Sunday mornings. We do it throughout the entire week when we get together. Wherever two or more are gathered, as the Bible says, we can worship God and pray together. So we love him first, right? We love as God, as Jesus loved the Father, and then we go on next. He, we, didn't just, we don't just love Jesus, right, but we listen to his very words. Look at verse 10. He says, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. And so what Jesus is telling us here is that we don't just love God. Well, how we love God is that we listen to him as well. Jesus listened to the Father perfectly, and he fulfilled the Father's mission that was sent and obeyed perfectly, right? That's a, there's a line in a hymn that I can't remember off the top of my head where it says perfect submission. That's what it meant about Jesus. He perfectly submitted everything he had to the Father. He listened to the Father and submitted himself to the Father's will, completing the mission that he sent. That's a common theme found in the Gospel of John is Jesus declaring his authority and saying that he will fulfill the mission that God gave him on this earth. We talked about that two weeks ago where he said he's going to fulfill that, see it through to the very end, is that he's going to obey that mission. In John 5, he says, I'm only doing what the Father is doing. He does only what the Father is doing. So Jesus is not only making that connection to his love of that the Father and I are one, but he's saying beyond that, I'm only doing the things that the Father are doing. I completely listen to him and I completely submit to him and I'm only doing what he does. And we're called to do the same thing here, right? To listen to Jesus by submitting to him in everything. That's what he says when you are to obey what I have said. You will remain in my love. You will continue on in my love if you obey what I say. To submit to everything that Jesus has said. And if we do that, You are my friends if you do what I command, Jesus says in verse 14 in this passage. You will be a friend of God when you listen to the words that he has given us. And that's really what being a disciple, we hear that word so often, right? Disciple. Disciple essentially means learner. That's the word that it means. I mean, that's really simply what it gets down to is learning about Jesus. To be a disciple of Jesus is to be a learner of Jesus, to know more about him and to do more of what he did. And that's what discipleship is all about, is we are his friends if we learn from him and we listen to him. We obey the commands that he has given us. That's what discipleship and listening to Jesus is all about. When we call ourselves a Christian, really what we're saying is that we're a disciple of Jesus. I know some people that that don't like to call themselves a Christian, you know, because they're all like, oh, you know, 21st century, we don't call ourselves Christians anymore kind of thing. They just want to be, I want to be a disciple of Jesus. And really what that is, is that's what Christian means, is disciple of Jesus or a learner of Jesus. And so we love him. We love him by listening to him, but then also we live for him. He says in verse 13, Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. And that's really Jesus' heart, is it not? Jesus' heart, his whole life, his whole life here on earth, the mission that he was sent to do He was sent here to live for the Father. He dedicated his whole life to the Father. I mean, basically when he went on his mission, you think about in Luke 4, when Jesus went out and he was tempted by Satan. And after he resisted the temptation of Satan, the first thing he did is he goes into the synagogue and he announces his very presence. And he is saying that I am living for God and I am here to do his work. Jesus laid down his whole life to live it for God. 
That's when we talk about Jesus lived and died and rose again. He lived. He was here and present on this earth and lived and gave it all to Jesus. Or <laughs> Jesus gave it all to the Father, excuse me. And we're called to do the same thing in this passage. Jesus isn't just saying that I'm going to lay down my life for his friends, which is very true of this passage. Jesus does lay his life down for his friends, both in his life and in his death. He laid it down for them. But we're called to do the same thing. And this kind of goes back to what we talked about the other week about obeying Jesus, because listening to Jesus is about hearing his words and doing them, right? But it's more than just that as well. Obeying Jesus, this idea of obey, when he uses that word, he is talking about not just listening to his words and keeping his words, but it's about shaping your whole lives around him. I keep forgetting to go to that. But he says that here in Romans 12, 1 and 2, a very famous passage that Paul, Paul is reiterating what Jesus is talking about when he says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. For this is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, good, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Paul's reiterating that every single day of our lives, our everyday lives, are lived to be shaped around Christ, that we listen to him by living for him and living out and shaping those words around us. Kind of when we talked the other week about obedience, we talked about the idea of a tree that shapes itself to be able to find a way to get light. And it's that same idea that we, we conform our lives, not to what the world has told us to. And the, the real, the, the, what he's saying when he says do not conform, he's kind of saying don't shape yourselves or like mold yourselves into like a jello mold of what the world wants you to be. But be a thing that can have your mind transformed. It's not just conform yourself to Christ, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind to live your whole lives for him, to shape your lives around him. That's the whole idea of what Jesus is getting at here, is that we're not just laying down our very life in the way that he's talking about, where we will literally die for everyone, but that we'd be willing to shape our lives around him. That's what it looks like to be a friend of Jesus, is to live our whole lives shaped around him. So then he loves us. We love him by listening to him and shaping our lives around him. But then lastly, we continue on and we last for him. I realize that the last point is last, so that's kind of weird. But we can look at verses 9 through 11 where Jesus is telling us about what it means to last for him. He says, as the Father has loved me, in verse 9, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. And this is what Jesus is saying is lastly, it's not about just loving me and listening to me and obeying me, but it's remaining in that love. And we do that through obeying and shaping our lives around him to the point that we're able to continue loving Jesus regardless of what comes. And why is he talking about joy? I mean, I, I, this is actually the crux or the most important, like the fulcrum, the, what everything else swings on in this passage is verse 11 where he says, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. What is he talking about? How do we remain in his love through joy? Joy just means like being happy, right? But joy is so much more than that. And that's what he's talking about when he says that my joy may be in you. The joy that he has is this whole joy of being connected to the Father, to have this loving, intimate relationship, to be listening to him and to be living his life around him. And really, because we need to understand that joy is not a feeling that we have. We can say that we have joy in our lives, and we've kind of perverted the word a little bit, but what he means here is he's not just talking about a feeling. He's talking about an attitude because joy is an attitude of alignment. Think about the idea of like, a, you know, like aligning your brakes on your car. I don't know anything about cars. I d depend on my friends to do anything that needs fixing around the house or anything like that. I'm terrible at that stuff. My dad would be ashamed. He's a mechanical engineer. He knows how to do everything. And I never learned any of that stuff. So, you know, like he passed it down to my brother. My brother's really handy. I'm totally not. I'm just like... I don't know, I'll just pay someone to do it. So, and I mean, it backfired one time. I tried to do something on my own. I tried to fix our overhead door, 
and ended up probably almost killing myself. And uh, I still can't really move this finger to its full extent anymore because uh, the whole tension just kind of like blasted me in the hand. It was really great. Um, <clears throat> so anyways, getting back to not talking about almost killing myself, uh, this idea of brakes and alignment, the, the whole idea is that when we have a car and we need to have our, uh, like our wheels aligned or our brakes aligned or anything like that, we need to have them aligned because what would happen if, uh, and I, I, mean, I mean wheels, not brakes, but if we have our wheels in, in alignment on a car, if it's out of alignment, what happens when we let go of the wheel? It kind of like drifts, you know, and we'll fly off the road. But the idea of joy is that we're aligning ourselves like we would align our car so that we can go straight down the road of life regardless of whether there's bumps in the road, potholes, or maybe just the road turns into like gravel and you're shooting gravel up everywhere, you know? Regardless of what happens in our lives, we're moving forward. And that's what joy is all about. Joy is not a feeling. It's an attitude of alignment in our lives. Where we're intimately connected with God. We listen to him and we live our lives for him and we will have joy. That's what Jesus talks about when he's talking about joy here. His joy that he has is because he is most connected to and more connected to the Father than anybody else in the history of everything. And he says that your joy is going to be complete because you are doing these things as well. My joy may be complete in you. And that's really what relationship and what being a friend of God is all about, is having that attitude of alignment, that Jesus' joy, the joy that he has that aligns his life to live on mission and to move forward with God, the joy that he has can be complete in us. That's how we have a complete friendship with Christ, is by having that joy that aligns our attitude towards him. It's not a happy feeling because there are going to be times that there are bumps in the road and potholes, like I said before, There are going to be things where our life is a mess. But if our alignment is with joy on Christ, by doing these things, we will see and move forward with joy. And we'll be able to live for him and to last for him, to remain and abide with him. That's another, uh, the word when he says remain, it's often translated as abide or dwell with him. And it means to be in the same place with him consistently for a long time. And that's how we can live for him. That's how we have joy. And that, like I said, that is the fulcrum, the center point of this entire message, is to have that joy. And that's how our relationships will be complete. And so that's, you're like, that's great. This is really good. So how do we do that in our own relationships? How do we have that with our friends? How can we achieve complete relationships with other people? Well, you know, Jesus is not going to leave it unanswered for us, is he? No, he's not. In verse 12, he says, my command is this. So listen up, because this is going to be a part of how we obey and live for him. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Jesus is telling us that we love other people in the same way that we love Jesus. But he wants to clarify quickly, and we need to understand this. In John 15, 5, or 15, 15, he says, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. It's important to remember that Jesus is our master. Like, to a certain extent, he calls us a friend. But there is certainly, because we just talked about it, that we are slaves or servants of Christ, right? So don't forget that Jesus is still our master, but we don't approach approach loving other people as a master-servant relationship. Let's not forget that. We are all friends. We are not slaves and masters, but Jesus is our master, right? He's our king. So we need to clarify, I just need to clarify quickly that we're not approaching relationships with other people as we're the masters and they're the servants. Because that's no good. That's not being friends. So that's why he wants to clarify, I call you friends even though I'm still your master. But he tells us to love each other, right? He says to love in the same way that he loved us. And we love the same way again. So we're going to go back. How do we love each other? How do we love other people? We love them. We listen to them. We live for each other, and we last for each other. So first of all, we're going to love one another, and we're going to love in the same way that Jesus loved, or that we love Jesus and that Jesus loved us. And it's going to be without a lack of fear or a lack of judgment. And I kind of talked about this idea of like unconditional love the other week. I think it was last week. 
talking about unconditional love and mutual care for one another, and really how we love one another is the same way that Jesus loved us, without conditions, loving each other regardless of what's happening in our lives, regardless of our status, regardless of all those other things. We love each other like Christ loved us. At the base root, that's what we want to do, is we want to love one another without that fear, that judgment that usually exists in our relationships, right? Because we usually approach a lot of our relationships, we're terrified, you know? Uh, Going back to a lot of the relationships that I made after all this stuff happened with my friends, I'm terrified of making friends because I'm afraid they'll end up like that. But Jesus calls us to love regardless of that and without conditions. But then he also tells us to listen to each other. I mean, that's really important too as well. We want to be able to listen to one another in these relationships. And really that comes down to two things of how we can love others, or we can listen to others. We can love them by listening to one another is probably a better way to put it. We can speak the truth in love, and we can submit to one another. And that first one, speaking the truth in love, this idea of listening to one another, is really what we want to do is we want to encourage, because we can't encourage other people with our lives, can we? To a certain extent, we can't. No, because we're imperfect people, but we're called to listen to each other and to encourage one another with the life of Christ. And we do that through encouraging each other with what God has done through Christ. So when you hear the idea of speaking the truth in love, don't think that speaking the truth in love is just something that you do. It's like saying hard things in a loving tone, you know, or in like a passive-aggressive way. That's not what it's all about. When, when in, the, in, the, in Ephesians, when Paul is talking about speaking the truth in love, he's talking about speaking the truth, the truth of what God has done through Jesus Christ in a loving way. That's part of how we encourage one another is that we tell each other about the good news of Jesus Christ and encourage one another in that way. But then we also submit to one another. And before you all leave the room because I'm telling you to submit to one another— <clears throat> And, you know, submission gets a bad rap, right? A lot of times when we talk about submission, basically when people hear about Christian submission, we think about, you know, like husbands lording over their wives and lording over their home, and we think about submission in that way, right? But that's not, we forget that in uh, a couple verses before that famous passage in, about marriage in Ephesians 5, that Paul encourages everyone to submit to one another out of a reverence for Christ, to submit to one another. It's a mutual submission that we do together to submit to one another, just in the same way that we submit to Jesus. Because we need to remember that the same spirit that lives in you lives in everyone else here in this room, right? And we need to remember that there are going to be people in your life that are going to be able to speak into your life truthful things into your life, and vice versa. You're going to be able to speak other things into other people's lives. And that's really what discipleship is all about, is encouraging one another with the good news of Jesus and submitting to one another out of a wisdom that comes through our mutual sharing in the Holy Spirit. That's what discipleship is. And don't forget, disciplers, the, the, you know, you might be in a relationship where it's like, you know, a, a, a 30-year-old guy with like a teenager, or it might be like a, a 40-year-old woman with like a, a new mom or something like that in a discipling relationship. But don't forget, don't ever forget that that person who is younger than you or less mature than you still has the Spirit actively speaking through them and can speak into your life just as much as you're speaking into theirs. It might be an 80-20 relationship. It might be a 70-30. It might be 50-50. You never know. But you're going to be able to speak into their life as much as they're going to be able to speak into yours. That's what mutual submission is all about. And that's how, we, that's how we listen like we listen to Jesus as we submit to one another because we're not going to have a corner on wisdom ever in our lives. So remember that. That's what discipleship is all about, is listening to one another. But then we also don't just love each other and we don't just listen to each other, but we live for each other and we last for each other. And these are probably the toughest two things in our modern world because the first one, to live for each other, is we're really sacrificing our time to build friendships with one another, aren't we? Because the hardest thing in building friendships nowadays is time because everybody doesn't have any time at all, whether it's the person you're trying to be a friend with or your time personally. I talk to a lot of people about this. What's the hardest thing in friendship? And consistently what I heard from people was that I don't have the time to build relationships with people, whether it's new friendships or continuing relationships with people. I just don't have any time. What do I do? I'm a mom. I have three young kids. How am I ever going to find time? Because these kids need my constant, constant attention. Like, they always need me all the time, and they won't stop saying my name over and over again. I just want to be called by my normal name instead of mom or dad for like five minutes, right? 
It's hard for us to find the time that we need, but Jesus tells us, and part of our relationship with others is to sacrifice that time, to make time for other people. And I know this isn't the most biblically profound, biblically profound point, but it's so true nowadays that time is what we need to make for one another if we're to have friendships. Make the time happen. Because if we don't, we're, <laughs> we're never going to have any friends. You've got to make that time but then also continuing over the long haul. I think maybe the most painful thing that we come to, and this kind of relates to time, is that a lot of times in our relationships, they just don't last very long, do they? Like I think about my college friends. I still somewhat stay connected with them, but we drifted apart because we've gone our own ways in our lives. And you know, don't hear me that like you need to keep the same relationship you've had since you were like, you know, 18. Don't think about it that way. But what we want to do is because there are going to be relationships that are going to change, right? Some people are going to move away. I've had people move out of my life that I wish they were still here because I know that we'd still be the best of friends. But they moved away because they had a job or they had to go by family or something like that that took them away. But we need to remember that we need to last and remain in those relationships. That's what Jesus means by abiding is really just dwelling, you know? And those relationships, they're going to take time, right? We got to continue to last if we want those friendships to continue. We have to sacrifice some of our time and we have to do that over the long haul. We want to last with those friends. Otherwise, we're just, again, we're, just, we're not going to be able to build the kind of relationships that we need to have complete relationships and friendships with other people. But I understand that it's more and so much more complicated than just time. Because a lot of times we don't want to give that time or we don't want to last in those relationships because, like I said before, it leads us to hurt and it leads to pain or it leads to feeling judged when we try to establish new friendships with people. We get so scared of different things in our lives happening that we just don't want to make new friends. That's the other thing. When I, the other consistent thing that I heard when I talked to people about friendship is that they didn't have the time and that they were terrified of other people. And I, I kind of chuckle because I'm like the extrovert outlier in all of that. And I'm like, I'm not afraid of anybody hating me. And then it's like, oh no, this friendship didn't go the way I wanted. Um, I'm kind of like an outlier in that way, but most people aren't going to get into that kind of relationship. They're afraid and they're scared and that's normal. Just like with my high school friends again. Like I was hurt and in so much pain over the fact that I lost like, I lost like 12 or 13 really good friends as a result of all of that because of the changes that happened in my life. And people are scared and we're afraid of that. We're afraid of those things getting in the way. But ultimately, what happen, what's the reason for that? It all goes back to the center point of this message about joy. Because honestly, when we're afraid and we're in fear of those relationships, it's because our joy is in the wrong place. Our joy is, not, is in those relationships instead of on where it should be. And that's how we're never going to have complete relationships if we don't have our joy in the right place. And it's going to be only complete when our joy is centered on Christ, when our wheels are aligned in our lives towards Christ and not towards other things. Because we're afraid. We don't need to be afraid, right? Because Jesus told us and gave us himself when he said, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Jesus understood the idea of rejection, understood being judged, understood the pain that would come with friendships. He was saying this in a room with them, or that, that man was already gone in this passage, but he was saying it in a room with people later on that would abandon him, that would leave him all on his own. Even Peter, the disciple who said, I will never, ever leave you. He's the one more than anyone else that rejected Jesus. He went to the cross for the people that he called his friends. And it's not just the disciples, it was all of us. He calls you his friend, and he went to the cross for you. He took the pain that was reserved for us and died on the cross so that we are not condemned. As it says in Romans 8, Paul encourages us, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We don't have to be worried about pain and being judged and all these things because Christ took that judgment and took that pain on himself. And now he says, you can love with real abandon, trusting that it's all in Jesus' hands because you have joy that aligns you with him. And those relationships will line up with him because you are in Christ. He died for you as a friend so that you can have a friend in Jesus. 
And it's neat, but the thing is, is that we can have relationships with anyone still, right? But ultimately, they'll be incomplete in Christ or without Christ. So, because we really can't share our whole lives, right? So, I mean, they're complete in Christ because we have joined him, but it doesn't mean, and I, I really want to stress this, it does not mean that we cannot have non-Christian or not yet Christian friends. I like to say not yet Christians because I always like to be optimistic about everybody. But it doesn't mean that we can't have friends who are not Christians. We want to value them and we want to enjoy them, but we need to realize that that relationship cannot reach its full potential without Christ. But that doesn't mean that we abandon them. If we look at verse 16, Jesus says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. What Jesus is saying here is that we are his chosen ambassadors, the ones sent into this world to bear fruit. And how can we possibly bear fruit as Christ's chosen ambassadors unless we're going to be appointed to go out and make friends of sinners, just like Jesus did? Jesus went out and he made friends of sinners, and that bore fruit in his life, and he's calling us to do the same thing. And I know it's not easy, but it's incredibly, incredibly needed. I was listening to some new uh, uh, research that just came out from uh, Great Britain recently, and there are so many people that are out there hurting. Um, Britain actually this year appointed a minister of loneliness within their government. And that sounds kind of like, ha ah, you know, lame, lame, whatever. And, but they did it as a result of a study that revealed that 14% of people in Great Britain, uh, they did it where they asked everybody, do you feel lonely? They checked either most of the time or always feel lonely. And we can extrapolate that to Great Britain's not that different than us. Uh, there's a little bit of obvious cultural difference when it comes to religion and things like that. But we can extrapolate that to America with nowadays with social media and you can get everything online with Amazon being able to ship everything to your door, with being able to have communities online and all these other things. People are isolated and they're lonely. It is needed for us to be those ambassadors out in this world. And Christ has appointed us to bear fruit to himself and to offer it to him and the Father. We are to bear fruit and to be a friend. By God's grace, those connections will lead people to be connected to Christ. We need to remember that at one time or another, there was someone out there who may, was friends with you when you weren't a Christian. And I know some of you might, you know, generations going back, you might have faithful families and things like that. But you needed, for me personally, when I went to college at, the, at UWSP, my friend Mark became my friend when I wasn't a Christian, and he endured with me when I was a jerk, because <laughs> he had only been a Christian a couple months too, so he was like, oh, I'm just a, a jerk learning how to not be a jerk now too. But he invested in my life, and I became a Christian because of the work that God did through Mark, through my friend, because he became my friend, and God bore fruit in his life as a result of that, and it led me to becoming a Christian and to be standing here up here this morning. We need to remember that those connections are needed, that we need to love people, that we need to listen to them, that we need to live for them, and we need to remain in those relationships. It might take years for you to see that fruit, but don't give up on people. Don't give up on them. Trust Christ and have your joy aligned on him so you don't get discouraged when they just won't listen to you or they won't let you live in their lives. Remember those things and remember that someday they could be connected to Christ, who we call our friend. Will you pray with me, please? Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you that you are our friend, Jesus, that you care deeply for us. You are our master and our Lord and our King who is over all things and holds the world up by the very word of your power. But Jesus, you also call us your friend that you've revealed all that the Father has done to us. And I pray, Jesus, and give you thanks that we are friends together in you. I pray, Holy Spirit, that that would send us out to be friends to other people and to encourage each other and to disciple those around us and also to make friends with those who don't trust you so that one day they may do likewise as we do. We give you thanks, God, for who you are, we thank you, Jesus, in your wonderful and perfect and holy name. Amen.